Hello again, everyone. Welcome to the Adult Sunday School lesson for April 17th, 2022. Easter Sunday, 2022. This is a, a delightful week. It's the highlight of the church year. It's one of the most joyous occasions that we have. And I, I only regret that we're not live together so that we can share face-to-face -face th these uh, images and these thoughts, but we're going to trip through the Sunday School lesson uh, and hope that uh, it serves as a stimulus for you to connect with uh, your Sunday School class and have a wonderful participation and discussion of the, of the lesson this week. It's a wonderful lesson from Romans 6 entitled Sharing the Life of Christ. I don't remember ever having an Easter Sunday lesson from Romans. Um, usually it's from one of the Gospels and it has to do with testimony of the resurrection. But this is teaching with regard to the significance of the resurrection. And as I work through the lesson, I can see how appropriate this Romans 6 is going to be. So buckle up. We're in for a wonderful session in sharing the life of Christ on this Easter Sunday. One of the greatest traditions in the Christian church is the proclamation, He is risen, and then the refrain, He is risen indeed. And if in our live Sunday school class that we will be having on Sunday, we are going to say this a couple of times and maybe even ring a bell when we say he is risen indeed. Uh, one of the highlights in my personal life is Easter Sunday, we have dinner and bring in the kids and, and grandkids and the price of admission to get into our house for Easter dinner is they have to say he is risen and we respond with he is risen indeed. So this has got such a family tie in to me. I'll probably tear up as I go through this because it's such a significant practice because it speaks so deeply to the Christian experience. There's no holier day for Christians than Easter Sunday. So I'm throwing out all of my, my critical thinking. I just can't bring that to bear on Easter Sunday. I react just like a kid to the good news of, uh, of the resurrection. So uh, bear with me as we go through this. Our, we're in the midst of a series of, uh, of lessons in the unit entitled Easter Goals, which are foundations for daily Christian living. We looked the first week at knowing Christ. Last week was having the mind of Christ. This week is sharing the life of Christ. And uh, the last lesson in this unit will be next week, bearing witness to Christ. So... These lessons are helping us understand that the pursuit of Christian living lasts a lifetime. We, in, in this lifetime, we experience times of success, joy, and wonder. There may be also times of grief, failure, and misunderstanding. So the Christian life is not necessarily a static life. It has mountaintop experiences and valley experiences. So let's buckle up and, and look at sharing the life of Christ. This is from the book of Romans in the New Testament, a, big, a bit of background about the book of Romans. I limit myself to one slide uh, in going to this because we could spend five hours just doing an introduction to these wonderful books in the Bible. But the main point in the book of Romans, as I find in one commentary, is that everyone has sinned and deserves condemnation, but God condemnation by God, but God will forgive and pardon those who put their trust in Jesus. I think that is the main point of the gospel, and that's the main point in the book of Romans. Paul wrote the letter to a Christian gathering in Rome in which he announces that he's finished starting churches in Asia. Paul is moving west. He, he, is, he plans on stopping in Rome on his way to Spain. And while he's in Rome, he's going to ask for money to support his trip. So that's kind of uh, the essential ingredients in the book of Romans. 
You can look at Paul's travel itinerary. He started off way over there in the Holy Land in Jerusalem as a persecutor of the church. But uh, he had a conversion experience and he started building churches all over the empire. He wanted to go to Rome. He eventually ends up in Rome. But he tells the Roman Christian that he desires to go all the way to Spain. Now that's significant because Spain is the ultima thule, the uh, end of the world, as it was called. They thought that nothing existed past, past Spain. And so when Paul says he wants to take the Christian gospel to the end of the world, that is a significant thing to say because it's more than 2,500 miles from Jerusalem where he started out all the way over to Spain. In this slide, I've also mentioned uh, a place called Tarshish. If you're, uh, if you're an Old Testament scholar, you might recall that this is where Jonah tried to go to hide from God, to hide from his commission. Instead of uh, going uh, to preach, he said, no, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm fleeing this command. I'm going all the way to Tarshish. And uh, on the road there in the boat, he, he was uh, thrown overboard and miraculously rescued. And then he, uh, he decided that he's not going to go to Spain after all. He's going to preach the word over in Nineveh. So anyway, that's, that's what Paul is up to, moving the Christian message from its heart, where it started in Jerusalem, to the home office resituated to Rome, and he, he's going to take it all the way to Spain. Ancient Rome was a, a city of, of culture and corruption. You could find many good things there and many bad things. So obviously, like any big city, the church there faced challenges uh, with a, a culture that didn't much want to accept them, and there was plenty of opportunity uh, for... Uh, for decadent living and to forget about the demands of the gospel. So it's good that Paul has written this letter to those there to help them deal with the, the culture and corruption that was available there in ancient Rome. As far as our lesson backgrounder, I'll say a little bit about uh, this lesson, that in the early church, people were often baptized. The new believers were baptized on Easter Sunday. So resurrection and baptism go together. In my own personal life, I was baptized on an Easter Sunday also so many years ago. So it, it, it's, it's good for Christians to think about our baptism on, on Easter Sunday because that's when new converts to the faith would typically make their vow and go through the baptismal waters. Baptism is a wonderful image. It, it depicts our old life being buried and we are raised to a new kind of life. So uh, it's, it's a, a word picture that, that's lived out in our life. It's a, it's a tremendously important affirmation of our inner conversion. It shows that we are dead to sin but alive to God. Seems simple, but some distort this teaching. And that's what our lesson is dealing with today, how... Some of the doubters or objectors, we'll call them, in Rome twisted Paul's teaching about God's grace and forgiveness. According to, to Paul, sin has no longer any meaning for believers. In fact, the more we sin, the more grace we receive. This is the twist that the objectors were, were bringing forward about Paul's teaching. That if God is so good to forgive and sin is the vehicle for God's forgiveness to be in play, then sin is good. It's like saying cancer is good for you because you get to see the doctor a lot. And seeing a doctor is good. It's a perverted teaching. Uh, on the face of it, it's ridiculous. But evidently some in Rome were objecting to Paul's teaching about grace and, and bringing up this idea of, uh, God's grace being manifest where sin once was. 
But believer's baptism, though, marked an end to the old life and the start of a new life. It's not like uh, a fixed life, but it's a new life, like rising from the grave, a, a, new, a new life from scratch. The effects of baptism are, is a complete regeneration, becoming a new person, not just a fixed old person, but a new person. Sins of the old person are forgiven because God does not punish sins committed before we were born. It's one way to interpret how baptism works. One commentator that I looked at this week says, the death of a guilty person ends all litigation. <laughs> it's quite funny. Uh, we're no longer under the law as baptized believers. We're not a changed person, but a new person. Baptism has that effect in our life. So Bishop Barclay and his commentator has drawn out Paul's writing of Romans and depicts it as a, uh, as a way of uh, writing called a diatribe that has a specific structure. And he lays out the objector statements and which we don't have in the letter. All we have are, are Paul's comments that respond to these objector statements but so the objector seems to be saying to Paul you say that God's grace is great enough to forgive every sin Paul yeah that's so the objector would then say you mean that God's grace is the most wonderful thing in the world Paul says yeah yeah that's so the objector would then say well then the more we sin the more grace will abound in fact sin is a wonderful thing because it gives God's grace a chance to operate. This is how they were trying to teach, the, twist the teaching of Paul to, to do away with Paul's demand that we are saved by God's grace. Let's look at the scripture and see if we can come to uh, some conclusion about this. this uh, I, I call these scripture in three acts. Here the first act is uh, Romans 6, 1 through 4 says, what then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Christians now live in a new place. The act of baptism represents our old self being buried with Christ and our new self being raised to new life in Christ. We have a new connection with God that gives us a new understanding of our place in the world. Until we are fully joined with Christ's resurrection, this is the tie into Easter, we're not complete in our new life yet because we have not experienced the resurrection with the Lord, but we're growing towards thinking, speaking, and acting like Christ. We have a life to live in the here and now, and we don't throw that out. We haven't yet attained to this to the complete perfection of the resurrected, resurrected Lord, but that will come in due time. Baptism that we're speaking about here, I believe the early church practiced baptism by immersion because that's the image of dying, being buried, buried under the water, coming up out of the water, similar to being buried in the ground and then being resurrected out of the ground. In fact, the word for baptism means immersion, to be dunked, cleansed, go down. Now, as the church spread and it, it couldn't always baptize by immersion because of persecution and other things, other practices such as sprinkling and, and pouring of water uh, over the head uh, became a substitute. But that these substitutes do not fully depict the image of baptism and resurrected resurrection to a new life. 
So Paul's arguments against willful sinning, responding to these objectors in Rome, he says, Paul says it's a terrible thing to trade on the mercy of God, to take God's mercy as an excuse for sinning. It's an ethical perversion. A profession of faith brings with it a new kind of life. We're different persons. We don't want to sin. We're not free from all sin, but we no longer willfully sin. The sins in our life are because we are weak in some regard. We don't go out of our way to choose the perversion of sin just so that we can experience forgiveness for that sin. Christian faith is not a mere ethical change. Believers are united with Christ. We're grafted into divinity. It's not an abstract concept, but there's a metaphysical realness to our life together with the Lord. So a true conversion, a person that's that's truly uh, turned their life over to the Lord, does not want to practice continual sin. You know, we're not called to a contract with Jesus. We are in a covenant with Jesus. There's a difference between a contract and a covenant. You know, a contract says you do this, I do that. If you don't fulfill your obligation, then I'm not going to fulfill mine. That's a quid pro quo, do this for that. That's a contract. We're in, the Christian relationship with the Lord is not a contract. We're in a covenant. The Lord wants the best for us, realizing that we are going to fail from time to time. But because we fail doesn't mean Jesus doesn't still love us and that we're not forgiven by God. Unfaithfulness of Christians does not change God's loving kindness. What a truth. This is a this is something to shout out and 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 ring a bell about. It's such a a great Christian promise. This is the definition of grace. Just because we fail does not mean that God's loving kindness, God's grace towards us is limited or changed. Believers sin, but God is faithful to forgive. In between the death of a Christian to sin in the past and the resurrection in the future, we're called to walk in obedient faith. That's what we're talking about now. How is our life reflecting the grace of God in the here and now until it's perfected in the final, uh, at the final end of the age? Wow. Let's read uh, the, the second portion of Scripture about being alive to God in Romans 6, 5 through 11. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Oh, we could spend 10 hours talking about this portion of Scripture. The baptism is an outward act signifying an inner transformation or union with the Lord. Our old ways are dead. If we still want to continue in sin, that may be a clue that we haven't really had a conversion. Our old ways are dead. We live renewed lives here and now. Ultimately, we will share in Christ's resurrected life in eternity, but that's not in this instant. We still have to walk an ethical lifestyle in the here and now. Because of our union with Christ, we can choose to act in ways that serve and help others, not just serve 
ourselves. So, as I read about baptism in the early church, uh, it seems that uh, people bathed, they were perhaps baptized in the nude, and when they came out of the baptismal waters, a new person, they had new clothes, white clothes put on them to signify that they, they're not a, a fixed up person, but they're a new creature living a, a new life unto God after their conversion experience. We recently studied last week the great Christ hymn of Philippians 2 about how every knee shall bow, Jesus, how he, though in the form of God, did not think it robbery to be equal with God, humbled himself, and because of that, because of his obedience, uh, his, his, he was raised on high and his name will be exalted by all at the, knee, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. The great Christ hymn. The Broadman commentator Dale Moody says that th this Roman passage, Romans 6, 5 to 10, is also a Christ hymn. He says it's a perfect poem, these verses, 5 through 10, a perfect poem of dying and rising with Christ. It's in the form of a creed lifted to crescendo of melody as believers participate and celebrate Christ's resurrection. So this is another hymn similar to the great Christ hymn in Philippians 2. In this hymn, in Romans 6, we're tied to the Lord. We are grafted onto him and we participate in his death. We are also participating in his resurrection. What, what an appropriate text for Easter Sunday. Now there's, there's endless speculation about just what the nature of this participation is. Do we participate in a poetic or symbolic way? Or do we participate in a concrete way, a metaphysical way? Many people have different views on that. Uh, you know, I, my view is that it's, it's a poetic and symbolic participation in the here and now, but in the end of age, it's going to be metaphysical and concrete. So I, I take them all together. But I don't worry much about it because I know God's going to work it out. Uh, it's, it's all going to, to uh, come out in the wash at, at the end times. I'm just thankful uh, that I have experienced the uh, forgiveness of sins and that my current walk is symbolized by a relationship that has begun but is not yet complete. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism unto death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. Buried and raised to a new life. That's what Easter Sunday is about. That's what resurrection is about. Key verse. Romans 6, 5. Here's a Greek word. Symphutos. Symphutos. It's got two parts. That S-Y-M, the beginning prefix, means together with. Like we have a word for symphony or symposium. It has to do with togetherness, being put together. And, and the, the root, phutos, has to do with growth a sprouting up, a plant that, that germinates and grows. So Paul's saying that our life as a believer is grown together with Christ. That's what a profession of faith and baptism into the kingdom of God produces. We're not separate from the Lord. We're grafted onto the Lord, grown together or grafted together. This word appears only one time in the Bible. It's right here. But it's a, such a powerful picture of what it means to be a Christian. We, we're not on our own anymore. We're grafted onto the life of the Lord. Believers' conversion, we become grafted together with Christ in death to sin and in newness to life. 
or in resurrected glory. So in this new life that we have, the question that we should be answering day by day is, what would Jesus do? And model our life on that. The words and deeds of Jesus are our outline and game plan for life. So Paul would say to the objectors in Rome, if you are not seeking the words and deeds of Jesus, then you don't have an authentic understanding of what conversion is because authentic Christians reflect the words and deeds of Jesus. So I pray daily that I will learn what this means to a greater extent and that I would be found faithful in this daily walk so that the beginning life that I have as grafted into the Lord will be perfected in a good way as I progress towards complete resurrection and newness of life in the hereafter. That's what I'm looking forward to. Vine and branches, is that a familiar topic? We're grafted on to the Lord by our conversion experience. He's the vine, we're the branches. If we don't see it that way, that's a hint that we're out of bounds. We're, we're not approaching our Christian walk in the right way. D.L. Moody, I mean, Dale Moody, who is the Broadman commentator, says that th th these verses in Romans 6 represent progressions from one state of affairs to another state. And we must look at the actions involved. These words, these, the, the, these verses that I've read go from scripture, go from a, a narrative, indicative mood, mere presentation of facts, to commands. He's telling us how to live. In other words, in order to, to be a Christian and celebrate Easter, we have to live in the right way. So there's a progression from the way things are to a command of how we need to behave in the world. What would Jesus do? Follow that as our example. There's a progression from life in the here and now, the present tense, in which sin sometimes impedes or comes to bear because of our weakness, to completed action in the future. If we were to parse out uh, the grammar and structure of these verses, we would see that when Paul talks about the resurrected perfection of Christ, he uses uh, a perfect tense, which indicates completed action in future time. So there's a progression from what we are now to what we will be when we are complete in the future. It's a progression from sin and failure here and now to full redemption in Christ at the resurrection. That's what we're celebrating today on Easter. The, what it's going to be at the culmination of the age when all believers are raised with Christ in glory. And there's a progression from prose to poetry. This is what I, I sometimes missed as a young believer. I took every word of scripture as prose and gave it metaphysical reality. I didn't have enough understanding to see that some of these concepts just do not translate to concrete reality, but some of them are in the form of poetry and beautiful statements. And so give yourself permission to look at the poetry in the great Christ hymn of Philippians 2 and the, the, the Christ hymn of Romans 6. And understand that uh, we don't understand it all from a uh, cause and effect relationship in the here and now. But as we progress to glory, we will understand some of these poetic connections. We can never go wrong by thinking of Jesus as the, as the vine and we're the branches. Our rule for behavior, what would Jesus do? And imitate that. Let's read the, uh, the final third, third portion of Scripture which says, Therefore, 
Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. So Christians are no longer dominated by sin or the law, but rather by God's grace. As recipients of God's grace, we are to live in ways that deepen our relationship with God and expand our participation in God's purposes. We're called to be instruments of righteousness, not of immorality and sin. This produces practical outcomes that improve our communities. All of these four dot points are from our lesson writer, and I think he has done a wonderful job of presenting in a non-complicated, easy-to-understand way that as Christians, we're going to sin, but we don't choose to sin. We are seeking to follow the words and deeds of Jesus so that uh, the ethical life we're li living produces outcomes that help not only ourselves, but improve the communities that we live in. So, Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. We serve and obey. Jesus leads. We're in for a hard time if we reverse this and think we lead. Jesus leads. We follow. The Broadman commentator Dale Moody says, the laws of sin and death increased by the law of Moses has lost its power to rule those set free in Christ. Life under God's grace is that newness of life imparted by the Spirit to those who die to sin and rise to live for Christ, which is us. That's what we're celebrating today. As Martin Luther said in referring to Romans 6, he says, Martin Luther, let us become what we are, new creatures in Christ. He is risen. He is risen indeed. What a lesson. I hope that you will join a Sunday school class this Sunday and be present to share uh, your comments and enjoy uh, the celebration of, uh, of the risen Lord. I, I would like to recommend a book from my library called The Heart of Christianity by Marcus Borg. Uh, in looking at uh, Easter and the uh, how that is the most important day of the year for a Christian, uh, I find it useful to retrace what is the heart of Christianity? How should we be living? This is one way to uh, invigorate, look again at what it means to be an adult follower of Christ. And uh, there are many ways to do this. Uh, so I'm saying in addition to your Sunday school, in addition to your own worship, in addition to church attendance, uh, in your own devotional life, find a book that would kind of rekindle uh, what it means to be a Christian. And this is an excellent way to start. It's meant a great deal to me in my life. Again, thank you for joining me today. Don't take me too seriously, at least my theology too seriously. Uh, we, we, I invite you to develop your own. You know, I'm an amateur lay person. There are many ways to interpret Scripture. Find a way that works for you. Remember our prayer concerns. Join a Sunday school class where where your prayer concerns can, uh, uh, can be lifted up as well. And again, I'll see you next week. Thank you, Daryl, for all that you do to help us. So until next week, goodbye. <laughs>